Where'd he go? Looks like here he is. Okay. I believe we are live. I have a little uh little flickering there, but I think we're all in here. So we have a full slate of people eager for our latest Apotec webcast. Uh, I'm Mike Amante, your host, and today we have the privilege of having a, a number of us here to listen to the illustrious Richard Colosi, <laughs> elementor, teacher extraordinaire, uh, literacy center master with the iPad, uh, who's going to hopefully share some great techniques and ideas on how we can uh, utilize these in our own educational environment. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Rich, and then at the end, uh, any of us that are here in the Hangout will watch. Uh, hangout to uh, be a nice captive audience for Rich rather than uh, myself, and if anybody out there in uh, YouTube land is watching, great. Um, and Rich, I'll take it away from here to you so you can dazzle and impress us. So Rich, thank you so much. Great. Okay, well, thanks to everyone for joining us today. We've got a great audience here. I'm going to be speaking about using iPad in literacy centers. A lot of times teachers will ask me, just for some tips because they know that I'm an iPad user. Um, so I'm going to go through and just kind of share some of the things that I do in my classroom using iPad in, in literacy centers. So I'm just going to take a second. I'm going to share my screen. If you just bear with me for just one second. I'm going to just switch to my desktop. Okay. And that I'm going to be sharing today is creating literacy centers with iPad. Over there towards the side of the screen you can see some of my students doing exactly that. I'm sorry, before I begin I wanted to show you just a quick video of some ways that my students have been using iPad in the classroom to practice one of the skills that's coincidentally one of the targets for the Common Core State Standards. The name of this video was Echo Reading with iPad. Now, we had kind of, me and Mike did a run through of this a little bit earlier. We noticed some uh, pixelation with the video picture. If anyone would like to check out this video that's uh, in, in, a, in a better quality, feel free to log on to my YouTube channel or my website at richardcolosi.com or at my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Richard Colosi Media. So, without further ado, here is Echo Reading with iPad. Hi everyone! Hi everyone! Today we're going to Echo Read on the iPad. Today we're going to Echo Read on the iPad. To Echo Read, we look, listen, and repeat. To Echo Read, we look, listen, and repeat. I think they get some point, Molly! Whoa, I'm just practicing. Here's how we echo read using an iPad. So echo reading is where a student listens to a narrator reading the text and then tracks the print with their eyes. Then they echo or imitate the reader. Check this out. Who would you like them here or there? Would you like them here or there? Hey look, that's my friend Emily. That's right. She's going to use the app Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. Let's listen in. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am. Whoa, did you catch that? Emily's looking at the text and listening to the narrator read. Then she repeats it. Right, she'll listen to this two times and then try it on her own. Do you like green eggs and ham? Some words can be tough, so if she doesn't know one, all she has to do is touch it. Do you like them in a house? So now let's go to Zach. He's going to echo read with the app, the 
cat in the hat. I sat there with Sally. We sat there, we too. And I said, how I wish we had something to do. You can touch different pictures on the screen and get their name. Watch this. Fish. Me. After echoing the story a few times, Zach is ready to be a story leader. And then, something went bump. How that bump made this jump. He's going to listen while he partner reads with his twin brother, Toby. Toby, we're going to listen to this and then we're going to read this. And we did not like it. Not one little bit. And we did not like it. Not one little bit. Wow, great job, boys. The goal of Icarini is to help us read fluently, accurately, and with expression. Yeah, it's fun to practice with the iPad because it helps us read better. So that's how we echo read on an iPad. Yeah, we love to talk some more, but we got to echo read. Goodbye! So that's just one of the ways that I have my kids use iPad in the classroom to practice reading fluency. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit later here today. So before I begin, I just want to give you a brief introduction to my history with iOS devices. I started probably about four or five years ago or so with using the iPod Classic. And we had just watched a video on reading fluency a second ago. That was the main reason that I used this device was to practice reading fluency. There was a great third-party attachment that you could attach right to the top of the iPad and it would, it would record my students talk and they could play back and hear their reading after they plug that into a speaker or into a set of headphones. So that was something that was really useful. But a couple years later, things really changed with the introduction of the iPod Touch. And this was a really great device because not only could I do some of the record reads, but it also allowed me to utilize all of the different apps that were available in the iTunes store. This was a really fun and engaging device that, that my kids really enjoyed using. But everything kind of changed about two years ago or so with the, with the introduction of iPad. Very similar to some of the things you could do with an iPod Touch, using iPad allowed a bigger interface, one that was tactile and multi-touch. It allowed for the apps, but it just ran a lot smoother. And this was something that was extremely engaging for, for each of my students. So today what I'm going to do is just share with you some of the ways that I use iPad in my literacy centers. Number one, we're going to start out with just learning ways to use iPad for skill-based practice. Some ways to discover those apps that you need in order to practice the skills. We'll move into some reading fluency ideas. And finally, some ways to, enter, to kind of bring everything together all of those three different areas to meet some, some collaborative project ideas, the interactive projects for the Common Core Standards for English and Language Arts. So let's begin. A lot of times people will ask me, well, why iPad? Why do you use the iPad? Well, first off, it's something that's extremely engaging to all of the students in my classroom. They love using an iPad. I think that there's, there's something special uh, about being able to pick up a device and maneuver it and use some of those multi-touch gestures as opposed to going to a specific area uh, and you clicking around in a mouse. There's something that's, that's personal about, about that device that my students really enjoy. Second, it's very easy to use. I've had the opportunity to train adults with using iPad and I've had the opportunity obviously to train students using iPad and it's remarkable how quickly students are able to to pick up the device and use it and and how they seem almost a little bit more comfortable than some of the adults do. The other feature that's nice is the interactivity. It provides students with immediate feedback which is very important for keeping some of the attention and, and, and maintaining some of the scattered energies of these students. 
the apps. We don't have to mention, but there are, we'll talk about this in a second, but there are hundreds of thousands of apps available, in particular for the, for the K2 grade level, apps that are designed to teach some of those basic phonics skills and stepping outside of reading, other skills as well, including basic numeracy skills and, and, and other things. So there's a lot of skill-based apps for those younger K2 students. Some of the accessibility features which are available on the iPad are fantastic, even if you have a student that, that might not necessarily be someone with disabilities. There are some of the features, including the large print, the ability to speak back text, that I think students of all ages could, could find useful. And finally, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but it's mobile. You're not necessarily tethered to one specific spot of the classroom. You can pick up an iPad and you can use it anywhere. And if you're lucky enough to have internet access, it's something that you can access your school network anywhere. You can go outside the classroom, in the hallway, outside the school. It's something that's extremely remarkable to where we're at right now. So in my specific classroom, here's a situation that I have. You can see on this slide right here, there are some devices that are on top of a charging station. Now, I don't have this particular charging station, but I have one that's very similar. So as you can see from my text at the bottom, there's 10 iPads for 20 students in my classroom, 21 students now in my classroom. So I have about a one to two ratio. So I don't necessarily have a situation where I can say, okay, students, everyone take out your iPad. They open up their desk and, and pull out their iPad. I have them on this one charging station. I have students share the different iPads. And like I said, I have about a one to two ratio. So it's a little bit harder without me being able to, to demonstrate for you, but just some management tips that I have used in the past is I give each of them a unique number. That number stays on the iPad and I'll assign one number for two or sometimes three students. This way, if there's any sort of apps or there's any sort of content creation apps, the students are able to use the same iPad each time. You don't have to worry about finding each different one. It's something that works pretty nice. In order to make sure that all of the numbers are aligned to the correct iPad, what I'll sometimes do is just pick up the iPad, change the wallpaper, and then this way I know, for instance, iPad number one is a SpongeBob background. iPad number two is a uh, snowman background. Just some sort of way that I can uniquely identify each iPad rather than having to actually look at the name that's on the device. Just something that's, that's unique to use. So within my particular literacy centers, here's an example of, of, of the makeup of one. It's usually three to six students. I try to keep things in the beginning, um, a smaller group of students. It's usually adult-led. Um, or it can also be independent. It, it all kind of depends. What I usually start out doing in the beginning of the year is really leading the centers, taking out the iPad, getting kids uh, kind of familiar with the devices, knowing to keep the devices on the table. If there's an app that requires them to use sound, I have them plug in headphones, kind of like you can see in the picture right here. But if you'll notice, one of the things that I have to work with them on is making sure that the that extra long cord stays on the table. It's not hanging off the table because oftentimes what happens is when kids stand up to finish a center, they'll leave the headphones on and it can it can cause the iPad to uh, to kind of drift a little bit to the corner of the table. Luckily, nothing has ever happened where it's where it's fallen off. But but just little sort of um, management tips. I find that it's really useful to do that in the beginning of the year, which is why the iPad Center in my classroom towards the beginning of the year is almost always adult directed. The nice part about having an iPad Center is that you can also differentiate the centers. You can have the kids do different activities um, that, are, that are geared toward their independent learning level. So that's one of the nice things. And I also use each iPad Center for an opportunity for practice. Now, when I was first kind of researching ways to use the iPad, what I noticed just from exploring and checking out some, some different things is that almost all of the 
K2 literacy skills, including all of the skills in first grade, were things that, that could be met through independent practice using some of the apps that were available on the iPad. You can see some of them here, phonemic awareness, writing, reading fluency, sight words. And this is, was my goal at first, was to really tackle some of these basic literacy skills that students really will need to, to, to have later on in their elementary and eventually their secondary career. So we often say that in, in the K2 level, students are still learning how to read, and then in the secondary level, they're reading to learn. So I think that's one of the most important parts in using the iPad um, in independent literacy centers is being able to, to teach some of these skills. So along the time, probably about a year or so ago, I came across this. And this is Ruben Puentadora's SAMR model. You can see SAMR, an acronym for Substitution, Augmentation, Modification, and Redefinition. Basically, you can see that at the bottom of this, the Substitution and Augmentation levels, the technology kind of acts as an enhancement to what's being on. The Substitution, for example, is ways that technology acts as a, as a substitution for something that you could already do. Whereas at that top level, that redefinition level, is where you take a device and you transform it, where the technology allows for the creation of new tasks which were previously not possible. So this is sort of the model that I use when I integrate iPads in the classroom. I start with something very basic, using the iPad as a way to, to build those, those basic reading skills that I showed you on the previous slide, and developing those skills, and then using those skills towards the end to redefine and to do some really fun and, and, and interactive projects so that, that the kids really get a lot out of. So that's basically just the guideline of, of ways that I actually use the iPad in my classroom. So let's talk about some of those skill-based apps that I had just mentioned. There are over 600,000 apps and counting in the App Store. And I know this number might be slightly below the actual level because it just continuously keeps growing. And one of the great things is if you ever search for a particular skill, especially in the K2 level, chances are there's going to be some apps that are available for that, for that particular skill. Now, in my situation, I have a, 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 my position as far as using iPad in the classroom. I have the ability to add any free apps that, that I want to add. I can just add those using a MacBook, and then I can sync them to each one of my individual devices. If I need an app that's a paid app, I request that through my technology director, and then they look into that, and, and through the volume purchasing program, they provide me with that app. So it's a situation that works really nice. I know everyone's situation is a little bit different depending on the way that your school or your district does it, but um, that's my situation. So I'm always on the lookout for new apps or apps that I think would be beneficial to my children. So I'm just going to take a couple seconds now and just share a couple of those apps. So right now, the one that I want to show you now is just a really good one for phonics. It's called ABC Pocket Phonics. It's available for iPad or iOS, meaning iPhone or iPod Touch. It costs $2.99, but this is a really good app that just allows students to not only write some of the letters, but it also allows them to work on that ability to build um, to build words, to decode some of these really basic words. And it starts out with really easy consonant, vowel, consonant words, and it builds all the way up to words that are a little bit more complex with diagraphs and, and different types of blended sounds. This is a really good app that I find is, is, is engaging for, for my students. This one, this app is unique in the sense that each student can create their own login with their picture, and you can actually go through and see how they do on each individual word sound. So for instance, for the short A sound, it will go through and it will give them a word. You can't really get an idea from, from this picture, but it will give them a word and it will have them say, ah, the student presses the, the A button, and then the T, and the student presses the T button. So you can kind of get an idea from this little screenshot here that I have. What it does, it allows students to build words. There's also a component where it allows you to practice writing the letters. I'm not so sure how, how much of a benefit that is as far as the, 
the, the handwriting mechanisms, but I think, it, if anything, it helps kind of uh, further cement that ability to correctly associate the right sound with the right letter. So that's ABC Pocket Phonics. Now I had mentioned the ability to differentiate. Another game that might be good if you want to differentiate this skill for someone who has, who's a little bit further beyond letter sounds is this one. It's called Chictionary. It's a free app, once again, for iPad or iOS. This is a fun game. You can see at the bottom, they give you different chickens, and each of these chickens have a particular letter, and you go through and you make your own words. And at the end, this there's, there's several different options. The option that's being featured right here is the speed play one, where you get about three minutes or so to make as many words as possible. And this is something that's a lot of fun. I'll have all of my students at, each, at, at the center, all five or six of my students, get to the screen, I'll give them a countdown, three, two, one, go. They'll press start, and they will try to race and count to see how many words that they can create. This also integrates that ability of, of sight words um, and some other things as well. So this is a really good one if you have students that are a little bit more advanced. This game is a little bit, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And I think this is what's good, is it keeps kids challenged and it keeps them engaged. And that's one of the nice things that you can do with some of the different apps that are on an iPad. I had just mentioned sight word recognition. Here's one, it's called My Word Wall. It's an iOS app. I believe that this one is actually an iPhone app. I don't believe there's a specific version for the iPad, but this just allows you once again to practice some more of those um, different sight words as well as that phonics ability. Right here you can see the screen of the different word family parts. Basically after you click on these, the different sounds here, you're able to build words together. So just a, a really fun and engaging one. It also gives you a couple of, of different options as well. And there's even ways to build vocabulary. This is a great app. It's from PBS Kids. It's called Martha Speaks. And it, this is just an app that allows students to really practice vocabulary. You can see right on the iPad screen there, there's a couple of different animals there, four different dogs, and you have to correctly pick the dog that's sprinting. If I demonstrated this app, you'd get a better idea. But I was showing this to a bunch of teachers uh, over the summer and someone had mentioned how an app like this with vocabulary could then be used into writing where you take that particular vocabulary word and then you use that, it, 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 students use that in writing. So I think that's just another really good one. There are so many different apps that are out there right now that target those individual skills that I think we're looking for as educators. So I mentioned to you my situation, how I'm always on the lookout for free apps, and I'm sure if you're interested in using iPads, or if you use iPads in the classroom, that you're on the lookout for apps too. So the question is, how do we find these apps? Well, there's a couple different ways. Number one, if you look at that App Store icon, you can go right to the App Store and you can search for a particular app. You might find success that way. Another way is just doing a, a Google search, trying to search for a particular app or a skill that you're working on. That might be something that, that can work for you as well. And then the third option is looking at some of these apps that actually allow you an app that allows you to search for an app. And an example of this one is the app Kindertown. Now Kindertown, once again, it's a free iOS app. It's targeted towards the K5, uh, the K5 area. And what's really nice about Kindertown is that it allows educators to specifically search based on content area. Now this is much broader than simply um, ELA. This allows you to search by subject area, by grade level, and you can also filter based on free or paid apps. It makes a lot more sense when you're actually opening this app and, and going through and, and demonstrating it. But um, this is an app that if you're an educator and you're looking for more apps for your classroom, this one is perfect because it allows you to kind of to break down each app, to filter each app based on grade level or based on subject area. So there's also some different maps that are available too in the newest version um, that, that make it a pretty nice tool when you're searching some apps.
And the other one, and I, I've talked a little bit about free apps today. The other one is called Apps Gone Free. And I don't know if you've taken a chance to look at this app, but it's obviously a free app. And how this works is app developers, what they'll often do is for a limited period of time, they'll make one of their apps free. And with an app that's free, that was previously one that you had to pay for, they see obviously an increase in downloads. And what this does is it raises their visibility in the app store as they become more popular. So this is a reason why sometimes developers will take an app that they were previously charging, say, $2.99 for, and they'll make this app free for a limited time. So what this app does, Apps Gone Free, this app allows, it notifies you every day, all of the apps, it searches the entire app store and locates those apps that are free for either that day or for a limited amount of time. And I've really been turned on to a lot of good apps this way. Um, it notified me when a particular app was available, when an app was free. An example is some of the McGraw-Hill apps. Um, I know that their Everyday Math Suite, which is a program that we had at my school, um, when, when their apps were free, I got a notification from apps gone free, and I was able to download those apps that otherwise cost, I believe, $1.99. So this, these are great resources. So Kindertown, apps gone free. If you're an educator looking for free apps, definitely worth checking out. So in my classroom, after my students have a pretty solid ability to associate sounds to letters, to decode basic words, they're now at the point where they're practicing reading fluency. So one method that I created using iOS devices, actually going back to the iPod Classic, as I had mentioned, is this method, method the three R's. So it's a three-step process for practicing reading fluency. So my students start out by reading a book. It could be either a passage of text or it could be a story that they've read in the uh, that they've read and they're just looking to reread it again for fluency. But I have them practice that several times. And as they reread, they really work on that pacing, that accuracy, and the expression. Those are th three things that are really important um, for, for, for students at any grade level to read. Because the more accurate and the more fluent that they read, the more they'll comprehend, which is the ultimate goal of reading. So the first step of the three R's is to have students reread either a book or a passage of text. After they become pretty fluent with their reading, I then have them use the iPad to record that reading. You can see there's one app here. We'll talk about some of the apps that I use to record in one second. But after they practice that reading, I then have them record that passage. And then finally, the last step is I have them reflect. I have them reflect or rate themselves based on their reading ability. So in order to do this, I've created this little uh, this rubric. I call it the Reading Star Rubric Sheet. You can see right from the screen, there's four different categories. There's awesome, good, okay, or there's robot reading. And they have a two different areas. There's phrasing in red over to the left, and then there's expression. So each of the students give themselves a score after they play back the recording that they recorded on the iPad. You can see the four different areas here. If a reading is awesome, I really work with them and make awesome be your best reading. You know, the reading that you think that you could, that you could do on your best day. Um, something along those lines. So awesome reading is a reading score that's worth four stars. And then have them think about expression. How would I sound when I, when I read? You can see all the way to the back, robot reading. Robot reading is reading where it's just a word-by-word -word type. Um, reading all the way up to awesome where for expression, awesome is when you read and you sound just like you're talking. So I have my students pick one of those categories. So if they have four stars, awesome phrasing, and then they have give themselves an awesome score for expression, four plus four, obviously eight, and eight reading stars is a perfect score. So this is just a good way to kind of build that metacognitive ability to get students to really think about how they sound when they're reading with the end result of that being the ability to, to comprehend what they've read.
So right now I'm going to show you a video. I made this a couple years ago with some of my students. The name of this video is The Three R's. Do you remember being a kid? There was times that you wanted something so bad. But no matter how hard you tried, you just couldn't get it. Well, sometimes learning to read can be a lot like grabbing that book. So we use the iPad and iPod Touch to help us read better. Oh, you didn't think six-year-olds could use the iOS devices in school? <coughs> think think again. again. We call our process the three R's. Here's the first step. Reread. Watch as these kids practice their reading. Rereading will help them read smoothly. Our teacher calls this fluent. Now, here's step two record. We open the Voice Metals app and record ourselves reading the book as fluently as we can. There's a little microphone right here. It helps us record. We try to make our reading sound just like we were talking. It's time for step three, reflect. We listen and think about the report. Listening helps us know how we sound when we read. Then we give ourselves a score for phrasing and expression. And if it's really good, our teacher might make this a podcast for the world to listen to. I can't wait to practice again. Three off. We read, record, and reflect. Technology in school has come a long way, baby. Oh, yeah! And remember when you wanted something really bad and just couldn't get it? Well, sometimes you just have to do one thing new. And that can make all the difference. So a lot of times after seeing that video, people will ask me what particular recording apps that I've used. And there's really not one particular answer for this, but you can see there's, there's a couple different options. You have first the Audio Memos app. You can see right from the little corner text. That is a free app. So you have everything from free apps up to GarageBand, which is $5 in the App Store, obviously. And I tend to use GarageBand most of the time only because I like the audio quality. I like to be able to edit right inside of that app. Um, but it's, it, it's up to you, the different preferences. And I think different apps work for the, the different the different uh, activity that you're doing. Sometimes it's just really quick and easy practice, so that might be an opportunity to use some of those the audio free memos. Other ones you might want to do more of a um, project type activity, which we'll look at in a second, and GarageBand might be the right app for that one. So speaking of fluency, I came across this app about uh, six months ago or so, this is an app called Fluency, and it's available um, for iPad or iPhone. But you can see this, this little thing. Um, if you look at the screen right there, this is an app that works with Dropbox, and it allows you to come up with your own text. You can, you can import your own text, and students can actually record themselves reading the text right on that iPad screen, and then they can play it back. Like all apps, there's limitations and there's positive things about this app. So like I had just previously mentioned, you might want to think about the objective of, of your particular project um, before, before using this app. But this is one that you might want to check out. It's made specifically for the purpose of recording recorded readings to practice fluency. So the final part of this I want to speak about is just the idea of integrating, bringing everything together to create some interactive projects. I'm sure that everyone is familiar with the Common Core state standards, 
if you look at some of the some of the language for the ELA section, particularly the writing section of the K-5 Common Core Standards, you can see text like this, analysis of topics or text, shared research or action projects, the part about publishing, interacting, and collaborating, or narrative writing. Um, I feel that this can really, all of these objectives can be met through using the iPad in our small group centers to create some of these interactive and collaborative projects that can eventually be published to the world. And one of the nice things is you can write right on the iPad. There's a couple different options, just like how there was for recording, but one option is using the Notes app. I have my students use the Notes app a lot of times to, um, to just basically when they're starting out. What I like about the Notes app, and I could, I could show you this a little bit a little bit uh, easier if you can see my iPad screen. But what's nice is I have my students start out by typing their name first and then going in and, and doing their writing assignment. And this way, you can see who is doing what and, and you can keep track of things that way, which is nice. I had mentioned earlier the accessibility features. One of the accessibility features that you can actually turn on is the ability to be able to play back the text that, that you have written. So a lot of times when my students have written their, their paragraph or their little section, I'll have them select all of the text. And once you have the speech selection on from the accessibility menu, you, a little option comes up to speak. And if you push speak, you can go back and you can listen to that, which is just a fantastic thing for my kids because oftentimes a lot of my students will um, leave words out or they will write things over and over again and, and they don't yet know how to take the time to go back and to reread what they've written. So this is a great app that um, it's one of the ones that's built in. It's a free app but using those accessibility features is, is a really good way. Another option obviously pages. If you're familiar with a Mac environment then you know that pages is the uh, word processing app for Mac, but it's also available for iOS devices. If your school uses iCloud, what's nice is that if you change something on the Mac version of Pages, it also appears, those changes also appear on the iOS version, just something that's nice. But typically, what I do is I have my students write stories or write a particular passage, and then a lot of times I will have them use different apps to actually bring those stories to life. An example of an app that I use to have them bring the stories to life is this one. It's called Puppet Pals. And Puppet Pals is an app I've seen teachers use it for storyboarding, like Jim Harmon, who did um, one of these sessions a couple weeks ago. But how I do it is I have my students actually write their own little play. Um, I teach them how to, to kind of to write text, or we'll do it as a shared writing experience where each of the students will contribute one part to the story. And then after, after it's written, I'll have them go out and actually create their own characters or find their own characters on the internet. And then we'll make our own Puppet Pals movie. And I'm going to show you one of those in just one second. But if you haven't downloaded this app, it's definitely one worth checking out. It's a free app with the option to have a couple nice features if you pay, I believe, $2.99 for the director's pass, but um, this is an app that are really that that allows kids to to do some of those content creation skills. It's simple. It's one that's quick and easy. And after you finish these movies, you can easily upload them to um, to iTunes after you sync, or you can send it back to iMovie. Just some some fun things. And speaking of iMovie, the iMovie app is one that's available at the App Store as well. It's $4.99, um, but this is a fantastic app. And I, one, of my, one of my interests is digital storytelling, which I really enjoy to do. And, and it's just fantastic to be able to have a device that does the filming, the editing, and even the publishing, all, an all-in-one device that does all three of those things. It's really, really a fantastic thing. But usually I use iMovie and Puppet Pals to create some, some individual projects. And I want to share one with you uh, right now.
And actually, in my school district, we just started the Common Core State Standard, the, 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 their curriculum for first grade this past fall. And the first component of that involves folk tales. So there's a number of different folk tales every day that the kids listen to. And one of the important skills for the listening and language component within the Common Core Curriculum Standards is having students be able to retell, to retell a story that they've either read or to retell a story that they've listened to. And with the whole idea of folk tales being stories that have been retold from, from generation to generation, I thought it'd be a really fun way for my kids to be able to retell the story of Little Red Riding Hood, which was ironically one of the stories that's in the Common Core State Standards curriculum for first grade. So I worked with my kids together as a shared writing activity. I worked with them to write the script to help them retell, to pull some parts um, out of their memory from the story that they sat and listened to. And here's what we have. So this is our version of Little Red Riding Hood. Hi everyone, our class read the story Little Red Riding Hood. Now we want to retell it. So we used the iPad to make our version of the famous story Little Red Riding Hood. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Little Red Riding Hood. They always called her that because she always wore that little red hood. Her mother wanted her to bring soup and muffins to her sick grandma. Go straight to Granny's house. Okay, Mommy. Little Red walked in the woods when a sly and cunning boy showed up. What are you doing, little girl? I'm going to my Granny's house to get her soup and muffins to help her feel better. No, I will go first. You collect kindling to help make a fire for her. Okay, that sounds like a great idea. The wolf was really trying to trick Little Red. He went to Granny's house and knocked on the door. Who is it? It's me. It's me, Little Red Riding Hood. Come on in, honey. Just left the handle. Time for a snack. Oh, no. The wolf laughed in and ate Sammy whole. Yum, yum, yum. Now I will wear Granny's clothes and prepare for my next meal. There was a knock at the door. Come inside, Little Red. Oh, Granny, what big paws you have. The better to hug you with, dear. What big ears you have. The better to hear you with. What they keep you with. The better to eat you with. No, no, no! The wolf ate little red hole. I am going to sleep after this big meal. The woodcutter heard the wolf snoring. When he came inside, he saw the wolf's big belly. There might be people inside his belly. I will cut it open with my axe. Oh, no, no, no! The woodcutter cut the wolf's belly and out came Little Red and Granny. Oh, thank you, Woodcutter, for saving us. Please have a snack with us. You are a hero. And after that day, Will Red learned to always listen to her mother. The end. So that's just an example of a fun activity that that we did that was based around the Common Core State Standards for first grade as well as some, some, um, some of those earlier skills that we learned about. It was something that we did in each one of our, of our um, reading centers. That was actually with um, 
one of my more advanced groups. What was nice about those, if you notice those characters, those really nice drawings of the characters from, from Little Red Riding Hood, I had found those just by doing a Google image search and I actually contacted the person. His name is Jonathan Chang, a, a graphic artist who had designed those characters. And I had asked if we could use it for this and he granted me permission. So usually if, if you're looking for images, that's, that's a great way, a great way to go. So just the whole kind of flow around this um, to edit movies. The first thing we started out with doing is just kind of brainstorming ideas. For the for the one that I had just shown you, it was something that was a pretty quick process considering that I that I kind of told them what they were going to be doing. They were going to be retelling Little Red Riding Hood. But the next step, I use an app like Notes to write the narration. Now for that one, Little Red Riding Hood, it was a shared writing activity, so I'd have each of the students kind of share their thoughts, and I was the one who actually wrote the narration, um, something that you can change for um, from your own students, depending on the assignment. The next part, recording the audio, I had mentioned from just practicing repeated readings. Um, I used GarageBand to record that audio. If you listen closely, you can probably hear some of the parts where I um, just kind of cut the audio and uh, had them redo it or had to cut because one of my other groups was making noise in the classroom when, when we were trying to read our lines. So just little things like that is what's, what's good for um, to use GarageBand. After I had that, that recording, after I had that recorded, I had my kids perform the animation using Puppet Pals. And then the final step was to edit the movie. And everything that I did in that previous movie was all on the iPad. So I would do the animation in Puppet Pals and then I would save it right to my iPad camera roll and then with iMovie I would import that movie in from my camera roll and that was when I could add some of the sound effects and, and some, of the, some of the music. So that's just kind of the workflow for one of those interactive projects which can all be done, which can all be done um, right in a literacy center. Um, so at this time, I think I'm going to take questions. I'm going to jump out in just one second, but for any other information on myself, you can find my website, richardcolosi.com, or you can find me at Twitter. Um, I apologize, my Twitter name on this slide is wrong. It's not at richardcolosi.com, it's just at richardcolosi. But if you go to richardcolosi.com, you can easily find the, the correct Twitter handle. So at this time, I'm going to get out of the screen sharing and I'm going to hop back onto the chat. And if there's any questions, um, feel free to let me know. Any questions? Anybody uh, have anything to, to kick in? I have a number of things. I was taking some notes as we were going, Rich, of some things that I picked up from Twitter, some other people that were watching and so on, but anybody in our hangout here want to want to chime in with any thoughts or ideas? I have a question for Rich. Sure. When you first start out, friend, the usage or ability of the user to use the iPad, do you teach, does it have to be certain things self-taught, you know, on the iPad, how to even manipulate it, Is, or are most of your students who come in pretty familiar with the device? You know, that's interesting. I think I get a mix of some students who are familiar with the, the device who use um, the devices in their own homes and a lot of them who aren't. But what I find at this age is that the kids, it's a device that kids can really pick up and kind of, the learning curve is, is pretty quick. It's, it's not that hard. But I do find that I have to go through and really teach some of the basic skills. For instance, one of the big ones, when kids first have that screen, I think a lot of times kids and adults as well are used to other multi-touch screens like at the supermarket or at the bank where you or GPS where you really have to push down hard. And an iPad is it's not like that. So a lot of times if you push down the icon hard, obviously it starts to shake and you can delete apps or move apps around. And um, this is one of the things that I'll have to go through and be able to tell them. Um, but after basically just the, the simple things, it's it's really not that hard. So I find that they pick up things very quickly. Thank you. Great question, Sue. All right, uh, Audrey or Larry, anything to? I draw just, Rich? 
I just want to tell you that's some great stuff. I mean, I'm working at the uh, at the high school level, but that your three R uh, thing, I totally my mind is wrapping around how I can adapt that. You know, with some of my writing students. And uh, is there any way that rubric that you had before? Is there any way we can get a copy of that? I'd love to again see it and kind of adapt it for. A yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I can share that. It's I can put it on my website, or I will send it right on the Appetix site. Or if I don't do that, feel free to send me a tweet. Drop your quick email or something. Thanks. Great stuff, though. Really great no, stuff. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I also have to do a. Sh oh, sorry. No, don't go, please. No, I just want to do a, such a big shout out to Rich, though, because um, I, you know, obviously share what he does with uh, people in our district and every place that I go, and he's just a rock star in that sense. So thanks, Rich, for uh, being such a leader in this because your work is incredible. Thank you, Sue. Thanks. Yeah, I also want to say thank you, and um, really looking forward to sharing these videos and this video. But I work with um, a younger group. I work with preschool and pre-k kids so um, which this all is really applicable to them too so we do a lot of this and I really appreciate your time and I'm gonna put a lot of these apps on my okay great excellent uh, well rich I got a couple of things like I said that uh, you know you had mentioned uh, early on you had talked about um, you know you're doing a, a basically a two to one for for your uh, would you like to do a one-to-one, -one, or is that in your future plans, I guess? Or for now, is the, the two-to-one working well? Well, for now, the two-to-one is working well. Obviously, I would love a one-to-one -one situation, and maybe as I do more, that's something that, that we can explore. Obviously, with any sort of technology, there's issues with funding and, and the whole idea of equity. So other things kind of come up, but I would love a one-to-one. -one. But having a two-to-one right now for this grade level and for using iPads in, in literacy centers, it, I think it works pretty well. Like I said, there's not a situation where I have each student um, you know, take out an iPad and have everyone do something at once, although it, it would be great to have that situation. Right, right. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I guess to go along with that, have you looked at or thought about doing any uh, take-home type uh, activities with the devices? I mean, it seems most of what you're doing is in this classroom around and working very well with the center in the room. Uh, have you thought about doing any of that or, or have you experimented with any of that yet? You mean allowing the kids to bring the device home or just doing yes. something on their own? I, you know, I haven't explored that. I, it, it's interesting because when people hear about iPads, one of the first things that they, when they hear that I'm doing, I use an iPad in the classroom, one of the first things they ask is, oh, do the kids drop them or do they fall? Or they assume that kids, I think, are going to be fairly reckless, which is not a, a uh, far-fetched assumption to make, I think, with, if anyone who works with kids at this grade level or who has kids of their own. Um, but my kids have been pretty good. One of the things that I've, you know, worked with them on two hands on the iPad, making sure that they're not just holding it, making sure it's on the table. Um, so I think I think the worry with that is that it might not make it home on the bus, it might get stolen, just things along those lines. But I would love a situation where kids could use an iPad at home. And right now I have several parents of some of my students who just have their own iPads and, and their kids are just love going on it. So they'll often ask me, well, what kind of apps can I get? So I think the interest is definitely there. It's just um, the object, I think, is taking the iPads from school to home in a safe way that would allow us to have them back in the classroom to use them. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great uh, set of thoughts. I mean, with that, too, obviously, you don't, you don't have, uh, you know, you indicated some concern of dropping them, so you're not using any kind of protective cases on the iPads that you have in your classroom. Well, we are. Um, we started out for, you know what's weird though, the entire first year I didn't have any sort of um, case and, and it was it was fine. Um, we have another case now. Uh, it's been pretty good. It's just kind of the standard. It's not a smart cover, um, more sort of like one of those little uh, cases that you fold together, but that's been pretty stable so far. It's not one of those. I know that there's some on the internet that are kid-specific cases with the handles on the outside. This is just a very simple kind of case and it's worked good so far. Excellent. Does anyone, has anyone here on the panel uh, have iPads that they're using, I guess, in similar situation to Rich? Any case recommendations that you've seen or used in your own schools? Audrey? Yeah, we have um, the 
gumdrop, and it's I like it a lot because it does cover the screen. Some people don't like to cover the screen, um, but with the pre-K and preschool group, you know, with wet fingers a lot of times, and it's kind of nice to have that section. I know with my own children, I've used the uh, the Trident cases are very good. They're very uh, indestructible. Excellent. Um, I actually had one other question for Rich, real quick. Um, in my district, we're really big on what you know. For the past year or two, we've been trying to implement the whole Columbia Literacy Project. I don't know if you're familiar with the Columbia mm -hmm. stuff. Oh, okay, you know, reading circle, you know, literacy circles, and then they kind of report back. I was just wondering if you had any suggestions for apps that kind of would work well for, I guess, journaling journaling with kids. You know, we're trying to get them to be more metacognitive about what they're reading. So any suggestions for, I guess, you know, keeping a, a reader's log or a reader's journal? Huh. I think the notes app is something that would okay. be free and easy that you could use. Um, the sharing part might be a little difficult. Yeah. You know, I that, that's kind of a what if they each had their own app, I think notes would be good. Um, Evernote is an idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking, I guess, for something where they can kind of, again, share all of their notes and like, they can all read the same piece and then share their notes on it and stuff like that, more collaborative. Right. Right? Yeah, I'm not sure if there's okay. any. I don't know if Mike knows of anyone. I'll poke around. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Uh, if you look to try to do some stuff with, uh, you know, Google Docs, Google Drive, Larry? That, some that's of what I've been doing up until now, but it's, uh, you know, they're probably getting every kid to sign up, and it can get a little tedious sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, Rich, a couple, couple more things, and then we can certainly, anybody has any questions on the, on the Hangout here, please dive in. But um, when you're doing the management of the devices on your, in your classroom, you mentioned syncing them with a MacBook. Are you using an Apple Configurator on that MacBook, or are you just uh, doing it manually through iTunes? Configurator is on there, um, so that does help out a little bit. Um, for the most part, though, I use iTunes as well. So I've done both. Um, recently, I've just done iTunes, um, so each of the apps are a little bit, each of the screens, they all have the same apps. They're just not all together, which isn't as big of a problem since my kids are a little bit um, more adept to finding the apps. But I was using Configurator before. Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, a couple of other things that came in here. The question about the rubric. We'll get that up on the Apotec website. And Larry, if you um, modify that, we'll also uh, uh, append that to Rich's page. That'll be fantastic. These are coming from uh, Aline Seda, the wonderful founder of Apotec, who uh, is somewhere remote in a cabin for the holidays, so she's trying to attempt to get on Wi-Fi to watch. So she's been she's been tweeting me and texting me as we've been going along here. Another great uh, suggestion as far as app discovery, especially with elementary apps, um, that she wanted me to put out there was one called Tech Chef for You by Lisa Johnson. Um, Lisa's on Twitter, and, and uh, she's, uh, I think, involved in some pretty heavy one-to-one -one stuff with iPad uh, down in Austin, Texas. And uh, she actually has an app out on the App Store called Tech Chef for You, which does some great app curation. Um, and I think Lisa does some uh, elementary education uh, apps, uh, instruction, et cetera, as well. So put that on your list of other great apps to look at. Um, and I think that is what I have as far as uh, kind of back channel or other questions that came in. Another free recorder I've used a lot on the iPad that works really well is uh, Quick Voice Recorder. I was just thinking of that as you were throwing out different, I mean, there's lots of them, but that's another one that's free that works really well uh, on the iPad as well. So uh, anything else, any other thoughts, Rich, or anyone else in the Hangout? No, it's great. Just, Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you to everyone for joining me. I appreciate everyone coming out and listening to me and the questions on Twitter, everything else. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for sharing all these great ideas. It looks like everyone who is here in the Hangout, I think, has a lot of things to take away and think about. I know I'll be handing this off to a bunch of my teachers. And, uh, of course, <clears throat> once this broadcast ends, we'll be putting the archive right up on the Apotec website. So if you go to apotec.com slash Rich Colosi, there will be a page right there with all of the resources, a link to Rich's website, and uh, this video will be embedded there as well as on the Apotec uh, YouTube channel uh, if you want to share it or tweet it out, put it on Facebook or whatever. So to everyone who was with me here today, Audrey, Larry, uh, Sue, and of course Rich, it was awesome to be hanging out here. 
And um, we'll be signing off now for today, but thank you for joining us here on the Apotech webcast. We'll be back uh, next month with another great ADE sharing some awesome apps and wonderful things with the iPad. Have a good day, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Mike. Bye.